Welcome back. This is Brighter Morning with Bo on MCTV. I am Bo Tiwari, your host, and we are talking to Ray Hallman and having a good conversation with him. Ray, you there? All right. Are you there, Ray? The connection? What's the problem? Ray, can you speak? Hello? Hello? Yeah, you on? We we had problem getting your sound. Yeah, I was I was talking to you earlier and I was asking you about your QRC experience. Hello? Yeah, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Volume has gone down. Yeah, I am hearing you, Ray. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, sir. Your volume has gone down. You, 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 are, you are almost inaudible. All right. I'm asking you about your QRC years. Yes. And asking you about how that helped to shape your sensibility. And how come you got involved with Pan and the Pan Yard while you were in QRC? So, how come I got involved in Pan? In, in Pan and the Pan Yard yeah. when you were at okay. QRC. Yeah. Okay. Well, I got involved in Pan just before I entered QRC. <laughs> I was 12 at the time, going on 13, so I would have been 13 in about uh, five months' time. I lived in Woodbrook, so and I used to love the overall. I used to love to go to Uber and teach cycling. My, my uncle was a cycling coach and cricket. I had loved both of those and school. So we, I was always around the Oval and <laughs> walking in on Travis Road, he's taking a little stroll with some of my friends. We were we we knew of invaders, of course. And uh, one evening, by chance, we, we stopped in front of the yard just to see what was going on. We saw some men, grown men, and uh, there was a little incident. One of the players tried to chase us away and then chase us off. And Ellie Manette came out and said, no, 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 leave them, leave those boys alone. And he invited us in. And was very welcoming to us, you know, and, that was, and he had a very uh, charismatic personality. And that's how it started. I, once I went in, I realized I had liked it. And I felt really comfortable. You know, the first couple occasions were a little, I was apprehensive, you know, how would I fit in, you know, I didn't know these people. But most of them, was so very welcoming and encouraging. He was a little boy from QRC, you know. <laughs> that was like a prize catch. <laughs> so, the managers were very, very kind to me. And many other people who, some of them were very rough in their interactions with fellow field bands. You know, those days of the days of, of clashes and a lot of violence and so <laughs> But in their demons with me, I never saw any of that. And so I was quite comfortable. It was natural that I would continue. So I cut my teeth in invaders, you know, I learned a lot there. They had some great time players there at the time. And Ellie himself was an inspiration to all of us, young people there. <laughs> and he took time to to teach me the rudiments, you know, I remember him. He tried to teach me how to tune the instrument. So I never really liked that banging sound. But while he was tuning, when he was fine tuning it, he would show me how to strike it. Above a certain level brought this distortion. So I learned a lot there, thankfully, and the spans were true. Chief tuning was true, so that helped to develop my ear. And uh, I'm very thankful I was at the right place at the right time. And then they gave me the opportunity when I was 
16. It's 16, really. It's arranged. My first tune, yeah. You know, so I mean, imagine that a 16 year old boy and I'm arranging a tune for the great and Judas. <laughs> Looking back on it now, it's like a fairy tale, you know. But it's, it's, that's how it was, it was true. So that was my experience there. And I just kept on going from strength to strength. Eventually, I left in uh, 1962. I started in 1957, late 56. But you know, with any artist or anybody involved in any creative endeavor, you, there, there, there comes a time when you feel that you, 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 you're being stifled and you're not, you're not being given free reign. And uh, that time came. And I left, but there was no bitterness or any around coin. It was fine because I went back and played with them, had them to the music festival, even though I was no longer a member. I was no longer a member in the sense that I didn't play with them regularly, but yeah. I was a member in spirit. So that, that was my experience there. I will, I will treasure. And then I went on to Starlist, <laughs> and that's another another phase of my musical career, you know. So everything goes in phases, as you know, Bo. <laughs> yes, of course. In the fortunes of a country. Yes. Um, but tell me something. I mean, Ray, you went to QRC and you were a very, very good student. You actually won a national scholarship in the days when they used to give two or three scholarships. And yet at the same time, you had this competing interest of music and the steel band. Uh, how did you manage all of that? How you manage that? <laughs> well, you know, it wasn't very easy to do. But uh, we were not people of means. So I didn't want to disappoint my parents, mother in particular, who was a nurse and Looks very hard up and down the hills of love until, you know, postnatal, prenatal, and postnatal care. So, in my conscience, and I, I couldn't tell, you, failure was not an option. I wouldn't have been able to see so. Failure was not an option. So, I made sure, <laughs> I ensured that I balanced the two things. You know, I have a great friend, Michael Baz, he always said, uh, when, they, when they read all the results, you know, that came out for a junior certificate as it was, what is GC 11 or F. He was shocked because he thought I wasn't studying. <laughs> yes. But I used to go home and study. You know, I, I, um, I, was, I was a very determined person. I, I said, no, I just have to work. And, and then I was also on the food 11 cricket team. Uh, I, my skipper at the time was Derek Murray. Yes. So I, I, I was in good company. Derek was a good student too. And so... So it, it just it was just uh, I was in the right area. Yeah. I was it was in the right time, you know. I, I didn't do very well at, at common entrance, what was in the time. So I, I did, because I never enjoyed school before I went to Kiwasi. Yes. When I went there, something about the grounds and the environment, it just you know, the savannah close by, the trees. I just fell in love with the with the school. And I'd never been there one day. I just went for the for the entrance exam. And when I came out, I told my mother, this is the school I want to go to. Yeah. It, it inspired me. So it is a sort of inspiration to me. Maybe you know where it was, where it was located. I'm walking along from school to Woodbrook, where I lived. From Woodbrook, yes. To Robert Street at the time. It was such an enjoyable walk. So everything yeah. about QRC served as an inspiration to me. And that is why I was able to balance playing pan yes. and playing football and playing cricket and do my study. So, so. Yeah, well, well, Mike Bazzi is my good friend too, and he has the greatest love and affection and respect for you and your oh, work. Thank you, you. you know that. Yeah. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> he's, a man, he, he's one of my uh, staunchest supporters and best friends, you know. Yes. Mike was from uh, 
Labre, I think, or was it Point? Yeah, you and then he came, when when he came to live, when he came to Tiwasi, a lot of boys used to give him, he used to give him, you know, tease him as a country boy. And he, but you remember that I was one of the few who made him feel very comfortable. Yes. So today we remain friends, and I always admired. I followed his his career. Yeah. You know, in his academic career, he had several degrees, and say, so, you know, I thought, He's a wonderful person. And that type of person in QRC yes. inspired me, you know. You know, you'd be around these people who they think. And uh, imagine we, we had, like, Wendell Motley was there at the time, yeah. Henry Wooding, Derek Murray. And so uh, I had good mentors there. Yeah, and that was a time... That was a time also... Um, in which some of the sports personalities were really world class, not just not just um, Derek Murray, but also Wendell Motley, who went on yes. to win at the Olympic Games in Tokyo. Yes, yes. And then, of course, Roger Gibbons, who um, oh man, he, Roger and me were in class together. Yes, he was. He was a fantastic cyclist. Um, yes, yes. You know, and a, a wonderful person too. I mean, all of, of these were significant people uh, who contributed, not just QRC, to QRC, but to Trinidad and Tobago and the world, really. They really made yes, their name yes. in the world. And there were others, you know. So, um, but, I mean, that must have been a wonderful time and a shaping time. What did QRC teach you that was lasting? Well, I can tell you, I can pick out a few things now. It, it taught me that it gave me a spirit of agentia. <laughs> you know, class was very open. It was a liberal school, so yes, it was. I became I, I became even more liberal than I than was my normal tendency. Uh, there was a teacher there called Doctor Max Shine. I don't remember his first name. He taught French. Yes. No, there was him. There was the Mister. Mitchell, Dr. Mitchell, and that man, he was very strict, huh? but he made a big impact on my life because he, he I, for some reason, he understood my association with the pan. Some other people didn't really. Principal was kind of wary of, yeah, wary of it and so on, but this gentleman, Dr. Mitchell, he really understood me and what the whole thing was about. So I remember he gave me a skip from form three to form five, and I don't know, I'm not sure whether I deserved it. But he gave me some, I'm going to put you straight into form five. You know, he used to speak to me as if, as if he were relatives, you know, and we yeah. all, we were all respecting him very much, and we were all a little afraid of him because he had a sort of glass eye, and he, he was shortish and robust looking, but he, were, he was, had a great, he had a good spirit about him. He was kind. And he was fair. So I learned from him those qualities. And from Dr. Max Shine, I remember him. You know, the boys, we all boys used to laugh at him a little bit. He had some quirky manners, you know. But uh, I never forgot. But he used to say, uh, for whom the bell tolls, my friend. That was one that he used to. So he used to say, uh, that means that you have to, you know, you have to do what you're supposed to do because you don't know when, you could, when you fail. And so that was like saying failure for whom the bell tolls. <clears throat> and then he had some things to say, what? drink deep or drink not of the Peruvian spring. I had no idea what the Peruvian spring was. <laughs> <laughs> he used to say, drink deep or drink not of the Peruvian spring. Four, shallow draughts intoxicate the brain, but drinking deep sobers it again. Now, as a young boy, 14 or 15 years old, that made a lasting impression upon me. Yeah. And, you know, you know, they always say a little, a little learning, a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. Yeah. And I see that in our country, that is to me is widespread. You know a little bit, and you feel you know the will. You just, so 
But he made me realize that I had to drink deep. Yeah. And it helped me in my music, and I applied it to my music, to my studies. That uh, I, uh, To me, you know, I, I would not uh, describe myself as a, a very shallow person. Yes, that is true. Him, he imposed that way of living on me. <clears throat> Whatever you're doing, you're trying to do to the best of your ability. You're trying to get down to the nitty gritty end. You're not on the surface. You know, not superficial. And I, you know, I have to thank that man so much. And he he didn't know. I don't think he did it. He didn't, he he didn't realize the effect he was having. And some boys were just laughing. Yes. For we and spring. You know, it was like a joke to them, but (laughs) just to me, it was a serious statement. Yes, of course. And it didn't matter where the Peruvian Spring was. It didn't matter the importance in the statement. It was that drink deep or drink not. If you're doing something and you're going to do, do it half it, that yes. you don't do it. Yes. If you can't do it good, don't do it. Don't do it. Yes. And, and, and I apply that to my music. Yeah. And to my teaching, you know? Of course, in everything that you do, I think, because yeah. you, I mean, you are really a very deep thinker. Um, listen, I want, to, I want to ask you something. Um, I'm going to ask you just two questions, and then I'm going to close up the inter- yeah. interview. Mm-hmm. What I, want, I want to ask you one question about how you see the country and what you think... Uh, what you think we might do, given that I sense from you that you think that we are sort of in a crisis, uh, which is a view I share. Um, And the second thing that I want to uh, ask you, well, I'll ask you that afterwards. But, I mean, when you look at the country now, yeah, we have COVID and we have all of these problems emerging and so on. But I think the crisis is much, much deeper than that and much more problematic. Um, what do we need to do, Ray? I mean, we can't go on like this. I mean, we can't allow the country to slip and slide. We cannot allow the future to be mashed up for the next generations of people. What are we going to do here? Well, I think um, apart from the economic crisis, you know, yeah, I think we are in a crisis of thought, of thinking. Yes that not many people start to see, not many people are given to thought or deep thought, not many people are interested in truth, because you know sometimes the truth hurts. So if we were to think and try and think clearly, and our thinking is in many cases clouded by emotion. And I don't see that as something that has helped us. So I don't know how we can get people to think objectively. You know, we lack objective thought. And if the country is too partisan. And part of the reason that, that for the problems we share is that we are not a homogeneous society. So we're not African. <laughs> or we're not just Caucasian. We are African. We are Caucasian and we are East Indian, but the main, the main two protagonists, or the, the main antagonism is between the, the people of African descent and people of East Indian descent. And that has messed it up in that people on both sides are incapable in large measure of objective thinking. I mean, so I, I hear the radio, look at the TV, and you know, to me it's sad hearing people spouting things that's obvious, making no sense. Well, the arguments are illogical, <laughs> and I don't think that they could be, some of the higher-ups could be that ignorant of logic. They obviously had, most of them think went to universities or institutes of higher learning. So they must have, in order to do well in those exams, you must have been able to think to a certain degree. So why abandon all that thinking now that you're involved in politics or... <laughs> Politics is the main thing. You know, we, we need, I mean, I suppose all over the world, that, uh, that's a being, the, 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 the subjectiveness, you know, the thinking just to keep power, to get into power. 
rather than thinking about truth. So as long as you're not a, a, aspiring to, to truth, whatever you get will be second class. So I think, I, I don't know who, I don't know, maybe the Almighty himself has have to come and institute that because it's so far gone now that this, that, you know, I, sometimes I don't want to listen to the news because I know what I'm going to hear. Yeah. Somebody in the Canada, I know what angle they're coming from. Because the, the, the whole the thing is to keep, keep gain and keep power. The thing is not about improving the country. And this is, it's a, this is why we are heading, if we don't check up, like me, the next two, three, five, ten years, we are heading for a, a social catastrophe yeah. unless it is halted. You see the young, young people coming up, and some, some are seen through the system, and you want them to be a part of it and to participate in it and to apply their logical mind and think out things. But, and I, I, I think the primary school though is a problem. Yeah. I hear some, some young people speak, and I think they have been to a primary school in the South of it. So uh, you must, you must learn to speak properly. You must learn the English. You must learn to form and put thoughts together. And I think the primary school needs a lot of attention. And that would go a long way towards collecting it. But then the teachers too. You have teachers. And that is part of the problem. The teachers have to insist on certain things. And the teachers themselves have to believe certain things. Believe what is necessary, what is fast, what is vital now at this stage. We need more, more than ever now. We need great teachers to challenge these, to channel these young people into the right direction. How to think, to read a little knowledge of history is important, and not to, you know. And the, and the thing is, as I was saying before, not to be superficial. You have to think yeah. deep. You have yeah. to be encouraged to do this. Yeah, you're studying a topic, you want to study carefully and thoroughly. But as it is now, oh, sorry to say, <clears throat> I mean, I, I'm not into politics, but sometimes change is always an important thing. Yeah. And people can, can, can learn to think that you have to, to know that nothing lasts forever. Yes. No one party is going to be in, in charge forever. So we have to learn to accept that as a reality. And accept that we have two major races and that none supersedes the other. Yeah. You know, mutual respect, I think, is lacking. The leaders have to learn to be more temperate in their language. You know, and that goes a lot because they're the top, you know, and you know they will say noblesse oblige. Yeah. A certain level of behavior is expected from you. In Parliament, I think, you know, we, we need to start, it starts there too. That's an important forum. People looking at the scene, the news, and what our parliamentarian expresses himself. Or how, how anybody behaves. The parliamentarians, the speakers, the, you know, people who run. You know, everybody is called to account <laughs> to conduct themselves. And the notion of fairness must be seen. You know, the notion of fairness and justice. <clears throat> and people have a responsibility to, in their presentations, to be factual. Yes, and not to denigrate and say things that there is no justification for saying. They have no logical basis. They just want to score a point. You know, we, we, have, to, we have to get out of that and, but to the people, we have to hold them to account. Yeah. The, the parliamentarians are not there of their own accord. We put them there. And they agreed they took a note to serve. Not to serve themselves, but to serve us. Yeah. We the people. So the people have to really demand more. Yeah, they have to demand more. And this thing in Tobago is that the people demand it. Say, look, we want... We want to change. I don't know if it's success. I, I, I'm not going into that. But the fact that you made a demand, so the electorate now has to hold you to account. And I think we do not hold our politicians to account enough. 
no, because really. of the racist, the racial divide. Trinidad would have been far better off if it were more you would say, monolithic or homogeneous because they, all of the, the arguments would be arguments that could appeal to reason. But the arguments we have, you know, appeal to race. So race has nothing to do with logic or truth. Yeah. A man is an East Indian. Uh, he's born like a man is an African, born like a man is a, a Syrian or a Caucasian or Chinese. You know, that is just an accident of your birth. It has nothing to do with your mental attitude <laughs> or your your intentions, your good intentions for society. It has nothing to do with that. So this is our problem, too. And I don't know how we're getting over that barrier. Yeah. The, um... Sometimes I think it's insurmountable at the present time. So we need people. You see, Bo, when, when I hear you speak, I hear something coming from somebody who is genuinely concerned and you're applying logic to your presentations and you are teaching. Remember those days, you know, I was never a member of any party, but I remember the days of with Lloyd Best. Yes. I remember those days where somebody was trying to do something or to teach. To me, he was more a teacher yes. and a philosopher like Morgan Job. Sure. They were, they were philosophers. And we need, the, uh, what I think the country needs, <laughs> we need philosophers to yeah. guide <laughs> and to teach. No, the philosophers, I don't know any of them who died rich. <laughs> yeah. So, I say, well, uh, you don't make money out of imparting that sort of knowledge. Sure. And to me, it's just measured here, measure, uh, success is measured in terms of, of how much money you have, how, many, how much property you own, you know, how many trips you could take. And so once some, somebody, was, I was speaking highly of Dr. Morgan, so he was, he was an, from my alma mater, right? He was a classic. Yeah, he was a classic. And the person said, he talking about jokes. He said, Joe, Joe, didn't, Joe didn't achieve anything, but he's still selling, selling books in the airport. <laughs> I say, well, wait. Did, 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 do you know that the man aspired to be financially well off? You don't know what his aspirations were. So we might say somebody, you know, so this is a kind of shallow way of thinking. You measure everything yeah, by how much, a, a, how much wealth somebody has. Somebody and I think did. that has sunk us. Yeah, because a, everybody you now grabbing for wealth. Yeah, it's a materialist view of the world, unfortunately. Yes, yes. And that is why the phil philosophical basis of politics has collapsed in Trinidad and Tobago. It and, has. And all you have is transactional politics having yes. to do with getting power and keeping it. Right, um, right. And that is the problem. And um, anyway, I, I thank you for your views because the views are important. And I want well, to close on this question. Ray, you must write your autobiography, and maybe you are doing it. Can you tell me something? I am doing about? it, and, and, I, and, and happily I'll see that your name is in it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. But yes. um, you are doing it. You'll finish soon? I think sometime next year. All I'm right. getting close. I'm getting close. But, but you know, it's when you're painting a house, or when you're building a house, is the fine touches at the end of the time. Yeah, yeah, that is critical. Yeah, the first, <laughs> thing, right. first thing is to delve into memory and bring it out. But yes, then, yes, right. Then the artist has to um, touch it up. You know, you have, right, to, right. you have to... So we almost finished with the memory part, almost. All right. Thank God. You know, I, I feel I'm in a prison, Bo. Huh? I can't be any. I feel I'm in a. I'm in a prison. No, no, don't say that. Stay in there until you finish. You see, it's like the composing and the playing of pan, right? So yes, you compose yes. the you compose the music, and you have all the angst and the suffering and the yes. the tension and so on. Yes. But the release comes in the playing, right? Right. Yes. You, yes. The release yes. comes in the playing. When you hit those yes. notes and you hear the notes and you see the response to the notes by the audience, yes. Yes. that is where the release comes, right? So it's the right. same process. So you're mm -hmm. writing, you had to go through the pain. Yes. Uh, but when it's finished, I mean, that is the joy, that's the release. Yes. 
So I, I hope have, many people will feel the joy in it when it's released. Yeah, well, I mean, I will certainly read it, um, not because you said I'm in it, but simply to, <laughs> to kind of get your perspective on, right. on right. life. Because I, I, yes. I, as I said, you know, I think you're a deep thinker. You have lived a full life. Um, you have given a lot to music, to the society, to the community, to young people in teaching. And you continue to be a teacher like myself. I mean, I try wherever I go to learn something and to teach somebody something if they're willing to learn. Yes. And um, I think that is a, a good way to live. So I want to thank you for being on my program. Uh, this is Brighter Morning with Bo. This is the last program that I am doing uh, this year, and I want to thank you for being my final guest. I know I had you on before, but I thank you for being here with me and for sharing your what I think are your own innermost thoughts about your own experiences, uh, but also on your concern for the society. One thing I would say, one thing I would say before we close, though. Yeah. is that, you know, multi-ethnic societies are the norm. Plural societies have become the norm. And I think that we cannot give the politicians an excuse for not managing a, a multi-ethnic society in the 21st century. I think that it is criminal to use ethnicity to divide and to mash up the society. And I think it is inexcusable that ethnicity would be used in order to win an election. And I think it is absolutely inexcusable and intolerable that any government in power would manage the governance process in such a way as to not be all inclusive in the way it governs for all its citizens. I just wanted to say that piece, and I'm sure you share that view with me. I share that view completely. Yes. Completely. Um, so I'll give you the last word and we'll close. Um. Well, Bo, you know, it, it's always a pleasure chatting with you, you know, and I thank you for considering me fit <laughs> to have as a guest on your program. More than fit. More anytime. Than fit. More anytime than fit. you can always call in. Among the best. Among the best, well, Ray you. Holman. Take care. Thank you, sir. Thank All you. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. We, this is Brighter Morning with Bo. I am Bo Tiwari. We're talking to the great uh, panis uh, Ray Holman, who has given a lot to this community and this society, and who has given the best, really. Always striving for the best. You know, the... The, um, the motto of Queen's Royal College uh, was all, or, or is, all strive, do the prize is not to all. And when I was a student at QRC, I taught it a very cruel motto because what it said is that you can try, you must try as hard as you want, but you might not win the prize. And um, I saw it in that light. But as I became older and as I began to examine it and to understand it, as my own consciousness evolved, I realized that what it said really was that it doesn't matter whether you win the prize. What is important is the striving for perfection, striving to be the best striving to do the best, striving to do the best you can, striving to maintain standards, striving to achieve things. Those things are important. It does not matter whether you win the prize or not. It is the striving for excellence, for perfection, for doing something well, uh, for, for being there when it matters. All right, with the skills and talent and the abilities and the capacity to intervene when it matters. It is those things that are important. 
and Queens Royal College would always be not just a pleasant memory for me, but it will always be a place that I know helped to shape me as a human being and help to guide my perspective on life. So I thank everybody that I have met in my life from Queens Royal College, all the students who were there in my time, some of whom remain friends today, and some of, and of course the legacy before and the students afterwards, but most of all the teachers who made such a difference in our lives. You have good teachers, you have bad teachers, but it's the mix that makes the difference. And I acknowledge some of them when I gave my inauguration, uh, inaugural address uh, when I became principal of UWE. So we take a break now, and when I come back, uh, we will move to the closure of this last episode for 2021 of Brighter Morning with Bob.